Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Ominde. This is the final um, lecture on the spinal cord and I'm going to discuss the clinical and applied aspects um, with regards to the spinal cord. So you need to understand some terminology. We have what we call plagia. So plagia, when we use the term plagia, we mean complete lesion. Then we have para, uh, we have paresis. Paresis by itself just means um, some muscle strength is preserved. So it's not complete uh, loss of muscle strength. Then we have tetraplegia or quadriplegia. Tetra means four or quadri means four. So tetraplegia is where we have a complete lesion at the cervical spinal cord. So the patient usually can move their arms using the segments above the injury. Okay, for example, if the injury is at C7, the patient can still flex his forearm using the C5 segment. Okay, so tetraplegia means all the four limbs um, cannot move, and if at all they're able to move the um, upper limbs, it's because the uh, lesion occurred at the lower cervical segment. So it's the upper segments that are helping the patients to have some movement on the upper limb but tetraplegia is four limbs being affected. So paraplegia is where both lower limbs have been affected, okay? And this is because there is lesion of the thoracic or the lumbosacral cord or the cord equina. So the nerves that are going to control the lower limbs will be affected. Hemiplegia is paralysis of one half of the body, so either the right side or the left side. And this usually um, occurs in brain injuries such as stroke. So we have what we call upper motor neuron lesions. By now you know what upper motor and lower motor neurons are. And just to recap, we said upper motor are from the um, cortex, cerebral cortex, to the spinal cord. Lower motor are from the ventral horn of the spinal cord to the skeletal muscle. So upper motor neuron lesion will occur between the, spinal, uh, the cortex and the spinal cord. Remember, these nerves pass through the corona radiata, to the um, internal capsule, then from the internal capsule, we see them at the cruse cerebri of the midbrain, at the basal pons, and from the basal pons at the pyramids of the medulla where decussation occurs before they go down as corticospinal tracts and relay onto second order neurons, which are the lower motor neurons whose cell bodies are on the ventral horn of the spinal cord. So what are the clinical signs of upper motor neuron lesions? We have Babinski sign. Okay, Babinski sign is uh, whereby when you stroke the plantar aspect of the foot, normally you stroke from the lateral aspect, from the heel on the lateral aspect going towards the small toe, then you turn towards the big toe. Usually, there will be a normal flexion of the hallux, okay, normal flexion of the big toe. But in upper motor neuron lesion, there will be hallux extension. So that means there will be sort of... Uh, dorsiflexion of the big toe. Why? Because this is a primitive reflex. Normally it's positive in children where reflexes are, are not well developed. So in infants they have hallux extension. But in an adult there should be a hallux flexion if it's normal. So if there's upper neuron motor lesion, Babinski sign will be uh, positive. Then superficial abdominal reflexes are absent. You stroke on the anterior abdominal wall, there will be no muscle contraction in upper motor neuron lesion. Then we have cremasteric reflex that's usually absent in upper motor neuron lesion. What, how do you uh, test for cremasteric reflex? When you stroke the inner thigh, okay, we have innervation by ilioinguinal nerve, and this will carry the information to the spinal cord and relay onto the genital branch uh, of the genitofemoral nerve, which innervates the cremasteric muscle. Cremasteric muscle is found um, within the covering of the scrotum. So when it contracts, it leads to elevation of the testis. So usually, in upper motor neuronal reflex, this uh, lesions, this reflex is absent. Okay, so you need to be able to describe the cremasteric reflex after you have already done your dissection of the abdomen, anterior abdominal wall and the spermatic cord as well as the scrotum. You need to know 
we stroke the inner thigh, so which is the afferent nerve, the ilioinguinal, which will relay onto second order neuron within the spinal cord. Then third order neuron is the gentle branch of gentrifemoral branch, and the effector is the cremasteric muscle. So the effect is contraction of the muscle causing elevation of the testis. The fourth symptom in upper motor neuron lesion is loss of performance of fine skilled voluntary movement. Remember we said pyramidal tract is for fine skilled voluntary movement of the distal limb. So that will be lost. So upset Babinski sign, absent superficial abdominal reflexes, absent cremasteric reflexes, and loss of fine skilled voluntary muscles at the distal limb. Then Extra pyramidal um, tracts, these are still upper motor neuronal lesions but involving extra, pyram extra pyramidal tracts. So, all those vestibular spinal, reticular spinal, rubrospinal, tectospinal. So, the clinical signs will be severe paralysis with little or no muscle atrophy. There will be spasticity and hypertonicity of muscle that could be exaggerated tendon um, reflexes and also what we call clasp knife reaction. Now, what you need to um, understand is that upper motor uh, neurons end at the spinal cord. Lower motor neurons end at the muscle. So upper motor neurons control lower motor neurons. So if there is an upper motor neuron lesion, okay, there will be paralysis of the muscle because the lower motor is not being controlled. But this paralysis is what we call spastic paralysis in upper motor neuronal lesion. There is spastic um, paralysis. And this is where you have hypertonicity of muscle. Okay? So it means that the lower motor neuron is, act, is working, but it's working uncontrolled. So there will be more contraction of the muscle. Then we also have, so the paralysis is severe. But there will be no muscle atrophy. I'll explain to you why lower motor neuron lesions have muscle atrophy. In upper motor, we have no muscle atrophy. Again, tendon reflexes, when they occur, they're usually regulated by upper motor neuron, uh, neurons. But if there is lesion of these upper motor neurons, tendon reflexes will be exaggerated. So reflexes will be occurring uncontrolled. So you just um, tap onto a tendon and the reflex will be exaggerated. You tap onto the quadriceps tendon and the patient kicks you very hard because the quadriceps tendon reflex is very exaggerated. Then we have the clasp knife reaction where there is passive movement of a joint uh, leading to resistance and spasticity of muscles. So the muscles on stretching suddenly give way due to neurotendinous organ mediated inhibition. So those are the features, other features of upper motor neuronal lesions involving the extrapyramidal tract. We have severe paralysis of muscle with no muscle atrophy. We have spasticity or hypertonicity of muscles, exaggerated muscle deep tendon reflexes, and clasp knife reaction. Lower motor neuronal lesions, on the other hand, are usually caused by trauma, infection, like polio, vascular disorders, degenerative diseases, or tumors. And the clinical signs, number one, we have flaccid paralysis. Upper motor lesions had spastic paralysis, very tonic muscles. Here we have flaccid paralysis. They are very flabby, like you lift the limb and it collapses down. So flaccid paralysis. The muscles atrophy. Why? Because muscles get nutrition from blood vessels and nerves. So if a lower motor neuron that goes to a skeletal uh, muscle has been damaged, so the muscle will atrophy. It's not getting the nutritive uh, factors from the neuron. Then there will be loss of reflexes. In as much as upper motor is working, if lower motor is not working, not going to the muscle, there will be no tendon reflexes. While in upper motor neuron, we had exaggerated tendon reflexes. The reflexes were there but uncontrolled. Then we have the presence of mus muscular fasciculation. So the twitching is due to slow destruction of lower motor neuron cells. And then we have contracture of muscles. So muscles will shorten and it occurs more often in the antagonistic muscles whose action is no longer opposed by the paralyzed muscles, so contractures will occur. So upper motor neurons have spastic paralysis, lower motor have flaccid paralysis. Upper motor neurons have no muscle atrophy, lower motor neurons have muscle atrophy. Upper motor neurons have exaggerated tendon reflexes, lower motor neurons have no or loss of uh, muscle reflexes. Upper motor neurons have absent reflexes such as um, superficial abdominal reflex and cremasteric reflex 
and the Babinski reflex is present in upper motor lesion. Lower motor lesions are characterized by muscular fasciculations and muscular contractures. So then we have the brown sequard syndrome. Brown sequard syndrome, how to remember it, is just the hemisexual of the spinal cord. So if you know all the ascending and descending tracts and where they decussate, you will understand this brown sequard syndrome. Okay, so for example, we have the lateral um, spinothalamic tract, which carries pain and temperature. Okay, so from the level of the spinal cord, decussates immediately at that level before it ascends. So if you have lesion at that level, uh, all the fibers that were ascending from the lower part will be affected. Okay, remember, hemisection is half. You can see half of the spinal cord has been affected, all right? So we have nerves that have entered, spinothalamic, immediately decussated. Okay, they entered, let's say they entered from this side, immediately decussated at the ventral white commissure, then they ascend as lateral spinothalamic. So if there's lesion at this portion, you will lose pain and temperature sensation from this side because decussation occurred lower. So that's why we are saying loss of pain and temperature uh, caudal to part of lesion is contralateral, okay? Then, when you're talking of um, corticospinal tracts, corticospinal tracts are coming from up, from the cortex, let's say from this side, decussation occurs at the pyramid before they descend as cortico lateral corticospinal tract. Mm -hmm. So if there is lesion at this portion, it means that the effect, the paralysis of muscles that are innervated from ventral horn, it will affect the same side of lesion, although corticospinal tracts were coming from the opposite side. So paralysis of voluntary muscles will be ipsilateral. Then vibration and proprioception, we say they come from uh, uh, below T6, gracilis will follow fasciculus gracilis, above T6 will follow fasciculus cuneatus. Then they ascend and decussation, the synapse at the nucleus, Okay, fasciculus, uh, nuclear gracilis and cuneatus are the spinal cord before they decussate, okay, as medial lemniscus and ascend to the ventral posterior nucleus of thalamus to the primary sensory nucleus of the cortex, all right? So if there is a lesion at this region, it means we are not carrying pain, vibration, sorry, vibration and proprioception from the same side because decussation occurs earlier. Again, so if you interrupt the dorsal column, you lose those sensation on the ipsilateral aspect. So if you understand all the pathways of the spinal cord, you just discuss all of them. After understanding where decussation occurs, you will know whether the effect will be ipsilateral or contralateral. If you interrupt descending autonomic fibers, for example, hypothalamal um, spinal uh, fibers from the hypothalamus to the spinal cord, Okay, you are going to lose control of autonomic um, system on the ipsilateral side. So that's what we call um, honor syndrome. So honor syndrome, if you have a lesion at the cervical uh, ganglia of the sympathetic tract, so it's characterized by meiosis, which is constriction of the pupil, ptosis, which is drooping of the um, eyelid, and anhydrosis, when you're not sweating. So these are the features of brown sequard syndrome. Now you need to understand, if there is hemisection at this level, you're going to affect the ventral horns, you're going to affect the dorsal horns. So you, are, you if you destroy um, those nerves at the dorsal horn and the ventral uh, horn, you're going to have weakness and atrophy of muscles because those are lower motor neurons originate here. And you're going to have anesthesia or loss of sensation at the region supplied by the nerves that are entering at that region. So that will be ipsilateral. So most of the effects in brown sequard syndrome are ipsilateral, except loss of pain and temperature sensation, because decussation has already occurred below the area of lesion. So you need to understand all the ascending and descending tracks before you can explain brown sequard syndrome. Thank you very much.